So in layman's terms, yeah. how would you describe uh, public procurement? Uh, public procurement in layman's term is really uh, government procuring services from service providers other than government itself. Uh-huh. Yeah, which is a, a concept riddled with corruption. Oh. Yeah, this is why for us in the EFF, we we don't favor this uh, wholesale procurement. Mm-hmm. Our view is that government must govern. Government must have its own internal capacity to deliver. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in fact, by the way, this is how even apartheid government was structured. You know, in the apartheid days, fortunately, you see, for me, I lived through apartheid and I've lived through democracy. <laughs> so I know both pictures. You know both. Yeah, Some I of mean, us I don't lived, have the privilege. I lived in Midlands. <laughs> Over the weekend, yeah. if there was a hailstorm, mm-hmm. on Monday morning, there will be a ganda ganda there. Yeah. Driving the township with uh, asbestos zinc. They don't even ask you. Yeah. They can't go on top of the roof and check. If there's a hole on the roof, they remove and replace. This is how it should be. Mm-hmm. You know, you knew that every Tuesday there's going to be a dirty box, uh, a kanda kanda to mm-hmm. take the rubbish out. Mm-hmm. You know, so government had capacity. You didn't have to outsource all of this to pick it up and all of these kinds kind of things. Government is, had its own capacity. Mm-hmm. So in EFF, that's what we're really saying that... Uh, Government must have capacity to deliver, mm-hmm. must have professional people uh, to deliver uh, the services. So that's how uh, it should be. Mm-hmm. And you had the opportunity to serve in government as yeah. the head of GCIS and a cabinet spokesperson. Yeah. Uh, at the time, uh, the country, there were a lot of uh, things happening. It was quite interesting. Yeah. Did you have any curry with the, <laughs> the ha! group? Ha! Ha! <laughs> yeah, no, it was an interesting time. In fact, I went to Zondo there. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Zondo concluded that uh, I enabled step capture. And just purely because Zondo and his people have not did not understand what I told them. I said to them, uh, which I keep saying today, that mm-hmm. GCIS even today does not have a budget more than 600 million. So that's too little for anybody to capture 600 million uh, for GCIS, GCIS budget. Because out of that 600 million, a big chunk, about 30, 50% of that must go to MDDA, uh, another one to brand SA, you left with very little, maybe 100 million mm-hmm. as uh, to pay staff and everything. So mm-hmm. most of the budget of GCIS is for those things. It's not for, for whatever. So I keep saying to them, listen here, if you want anybody that is captured, that decided to put money in the new age, it's not GCIS, it's the individual government departments. They are the ones that own the mandate. They are the ones that make the decisions. Mm-hmm. Now for you to blame me, uh, it's not fair. But so not was not understanding this because I was in the crosshairs as the Zuma people that needed to be nailed. Mm-hmm. So I was nailed for nothing <laughs> uh, in that yeah. thing. I mean, the 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 DG of GCIS that is not a super DG. If another DG from another department mm-hmm. decided that I'm advertising at the yeah. new age, sure, you, there's nothing you can do. So all you do at GCIS is to consolidate and then ask for discounts. Mm-hmm. Now, if you had asked me. How much discounts did I get? I would have told him that uh, on one of the years, for instance, uh, 2011, 2012, we had 30 million uh, discount <coughs> that mm-hmm. uh, we, we saved the government that money. So instead of clapping hands for GCIS, yeah. they say you enable state capture purely just to uh, muddy <laughs> my name. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's really the yeah. uh, nonsensical uh, position from Zondo. Talking about clapping hands, you are among dignitaries who clapped hands for Mr. Tom Motsipe, Tabo Best. Ah, <laughs> ah, 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 Did you see yeah. that time? Ah, were yeah. you aware? No, <laughs> were you? I think I was conned there because what actually happened is that uh, we're invited <laughs> to, I think, 21st century yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. company. It was some company in the media space. So that's what we went there for. So, okay, here's a new player. Uh, I mean, this in this area, in this space, and all of that. So I went there uh, innocently. Yeah. And all of a sudden, they started playing a video of this guy uh, in his in birthday. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah, so people say I attended the birthday. I didn't attend any birthday. It's like you're going to a, a Chiefs and Pirates game. Yeah. And in the middle of the uh, process, they <clears> decide <throat> to play, uh, what's it, uh, Dr. Koza's uh, birthday <laughs> message. Uh, and then all of a sudden, you're in, in, in Dr. Koza's uh, birthday party. I, I think it's just an unfair characterization. But yeah, 
Yeah. I was there. It was a very nice event, I must tell you. Yeah. Super event and everything, uh, except then they played this guy as thing. Yeah. yeah. And little did you know that this guy is sexually in prison? I didn't know this. This guy, this guy is a, is, this guy is a pro. He is a pro, this guy. Um, he, 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 it, he was like in the US, was like overseas and everything. Mm-hmm. And uh, you could see that money is not a problem. And also because they said it's Mutsipe's son mm-hmm. and that gave him all the currency, you put your guts down. Mm-hmm. Uh, you expect Mutsipe's son to be uh, wealthy and all of that. Yeah. You know, because Mutsipe is wealthy as I know him. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we put our guts down and it turned out to be a con. So yeah. I was conned. Your take on the dubious uh, SAA uh, Takazo deal, which is now under the spotlight, we understand Parliament now wants the deal to be investigated by SIU. Yeah, no, I think it's a, it's the right route, the Parliament, that it's it's going. Mm-hmm. Uh, because indeed, uh, despite all the excuses that we hear from Bravin about uh, during the initial stage, the things was devalued because of this, that, and the other, mm-hmm. and all of that. But uh, clearly, it was very eye-raising mm-hmm. that uh, those assets uh, of the uh, of the SAA can be as little as a uh, three billion. Mm-hmm. Uh, then you get the entire airline. That was very suspicious, uh, as it were. But indeed, uh, as we have it now, we know that had that gone through, it means they would have doubled in a short period of time. Mm -hmm. And can you imagine the dividends that would have flowed out of that? Mm -hmm. And also the fact that uh, Pravin did not want to make the uh, agreements public. Mm -hmm. Uh, That on its own just showed that uh, there is something that was hiding uh, in that thing. So indeed, uh, I think uh, the processes that are unfolding are correct processes. Mm -hmm. And we hope that the culprits will be brought to book uh, Mm -hmm. should there have been any shenanigans in that process. Stand up, South Africa! Make sure that South Africa, you are counted with me. Run South Africa. Stand and make sure that our people understand that the need to be revolution in South Africa is guaranteed that under the EFF, this country will be the better. EFF is a COVID thing. The people of South Africa, Africa and the world, thank you very much for tuning in. This is the EFF podcast and I am Titus Tungu. We're coming to you from Winnie Madigizela Mandela House. And my guest today is fighter Mzonele Mani. He's the EFF MP who's going to give us a high level overview uh, about the EFF's plan of action when it comes to the issues of uh, public procurement ahead of the uh, 2024 general elections. Uh, fighter Mzonele Mani, uh, great pleasure to have you on the show. Sure. Welcome. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Some of us know you as um, a communication firebrand. If you may just talk us through your early life. My? Your early life. My early life. Mm-hmm. Hey, how much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> All day. <laughs> 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 you Let's know, go. <laughs> a 60-year-old man yeah. uh, asking him about early life is a long story. But yeah. to cut it short, very mm-hmm. briefly, I started my career in the geology space. Mm-hmm. Uh, I spent about 10 years in the geology uh, space, uh, both mining and exploration geology. Yeah. Uh, and then I went from there into the... Uh, uh, what you call car business uh, in the okay. auto sector. Mm-hmm. I worked for Toyota for a good uh, five odd years, mm-hmm. um, uh, based here in in Sentin, and all of that. Did a lot of trips to Japan and all of that in the auto sector. Mm-hmm. And then from there, I went into uh, banking. Uh, the first person actually to introduce me, to introduce me to banking was Professor Nkuhlu. Mm-hmm. He started an outfit called the MIG, mm-hmm. Big Bank, where he bought a stake in the Bank of Transkai then. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was part of that uh, BE deal, 1998 about. Mm-hmm. And then we did that, and then uh, uh, President Mbeki took him to be his economic advisor. This thing collapsed, and then I then m- moved into the Netco Group, Mm-hmm. Then I was at People's Bank for, for, for since then until I think around 2005 mm-hmm. uh, in, in People's Bank. And that's where I really learned a lot of banking mm-hmm. uh, in, in People's Bank. I used to run a division there, okay. business banking, mm-hmm. at a book of about a billion rand. So it was uh, really a uh, good going mm-hmm. up until NetBank decided that, you know, People's Bank is chowing the market of NetBank. They needed to collapse them uh, and have one 
single brand of green mm -hmm. and all of that. So I left that in short. Then I went to Barclays Bank PLC. Uh, also then that gave me a lot of international experience in oh, banking. Okay. Uh, and then I left PLC, uh, Barclays Bank PLC at some point. I'm summarizing. Uh, then sure. I went into uh, the ICT space, worked for mm -hmm. IBM. Uh, that also gave me a lot of exposure in the ICT space and all of the issues around ICT. Uh, also, there were charters at that stage uh, that were being developed as part of those processes. Uh, and then went to uh, Tiger Brands, mm -hmm. uh, my last corporate job at Tiger Brands, uh, uh, fast-moving uh, consumer goods, mm -hmm. FMCG. Uh, spent some time there. Yeah. And then after a while, I then decided that, look, I think uh, uh, I've made my contribution mm -hmm. in the uh, uh, private sector. Mm -hmm. It's time that I, I, I do a national duty. So when I went to government, uh, I went to government uh, not to get a job. Didn't okay. get the people say, hey, you get deployed. No, actually, I didn't even, was not even part of the deployment committee of the ANC. Mm -hmm. uh, when I went into a government job to mm -hmm. apply for this DG position, I was there mm -hmm. to make a contribution because I had been through a few of these corporates and I could see they don't want to transform. Okay. And I thought if I'm in government, I sit in a pole position to drive transformation as a DG. Oh. So I got that job and uh, I got interrupted then by all these other ministers that uh, are just <laughs> too big headed. Uh, don't allow you to do your operations work. They just want to get involved mm -hmm. and interfere with your work and all of that. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, had they allowed some of us to do what needed to be done, Trust me, South Africa will be different now. But I can confidently say without fear of contradiction that during my era as either the uh, chairperson of the Commission for Employment Equity or DG Labor, mm -hmm. the issue of employment equity was a boardroom agenda item. Everybody knew that yeah. this is something that they had to do. Since then, uh, they just do as they please mm -hmm. uh, and all of that. So that's really... Uh, um, what happened and then went into government and then from government I'm back now into the space mm -hmm. uh, I went into entrepreneurship mm -hmm. and all of that and uh, I bought the uh, uh, the controversial N7 through <laughs> vendor financing yeah. you know this this process called vendor financing is an international finance mechanism mm -hmm. that is well recognized mm -hmm. uh, vendor financing but money when you got there somehow people <clears> think it's <throat> corruption think it's all other funny things. Mm -hmm. Yet even big people mm -hmm. uh, like uh, Mutsipes of this world, they've done vendor financing. Ramaphosa himself mm -hmm. with his loan mint deal code did vendor financing. But when poor money does it, then they say it's corruption, is this or that, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, in fact, I would argue that vendor financing should actually be one of the mechanisms used uh, to, uh, to, to do transformation. Mm -hmm. Because it actually gives... It gives the white monopoly capital an opportunity of atonement and an opportunity to take responsibility for all the uh, capitalistic things that they've been doing over the years. Mm -hmm. That is time that they give other players an opportunity and back that up. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I'm a serious advocate for vendor financing. I think it should be promoted even more. Mm -hmm. Imagine, I mean, a, a situation where we, you just take over 450 people say, where did you get 450 million? No, I didn't have 450 million. I still don't have <laughs> 450 million. But yeah. those guys said, this is worth 450 million. You pay us a a, a monthly, a, a, a yearly installment of so uh -huh. much. Uh -huh. That's what you do. And through the operations, you try and service that debt. So, I mean, that's the best way to do things. Mm -hmm. Imagine right now, if you were to do vendor financing on Acelomital, mm -hmm. you get to buy Acelomital, uh, for instance, on however many billions, you do a vendor financing, you pay them once a year, you'll, you'll run a thriving business. Mm -hmm. So, And yeah. you were accused of uh, enabling uh, state capture because of your close uh, relations with the former president and uh, those that the, 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 the president was doing business with, uh, known as the Gupta brothers yeah. at the time. Yeah. Uh, would you say you enabled uh, state capture through your involvement in, for example, setting up ANN7? No. Uh, look, the only time we can enable is when you're in government. ANN7, mm -hmm. uh, I was outside government. Mm -hmm. uh, so in government, I was a GCIS. Mm -hmm. So the only mm -hmm. time 
it's the government spend. So the understanding was that Manyi is sitting with billions yes. and decides that these billions are going to the Guptas, which was not true. The truth of the matter is that, as probably said it earlier, truth of the matter is that whatever billions go into uh, GCIS, those billions are already spoken for. The DGs of these other departments would have already decided where to spend. And all you do at GCIS, you just consolidate and go and ask for a bulk <coughs> uh, discount, which was what was a fal- function of GCIS, mm-hmm. bulk buying. So you consolidate and you just go and ask for discounts and all of that. So if it turns out that uh, money, in fact, even even with that uh, happening, mm-hmm. the Guptas got maybe 4 or 5% of the total spend. And um, it's not like they got 95%. So I don't even understand the hoo-ha uh, about it because they got at best 4 or 5%. The numbers are there to check this out. Uh, so it's not like they, they, they got that. But whatever they got mm-hmm. was not a decision of GCIS. was a decision of the line departments. They are the ones that decided. And I told Zondo that to go and check the requisitions that go to GCIS. They come with a signature of uh, either head of communication from this department to another department. They decide, they instruct GCIS. GCIS is a service provider. It's, mm-hmm. a, it's, a, it's a conveyor belt. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's what GCIS does. They just get there. Everything has got a, a number. It's got a signature. It's got a destination. So you consolidate the destinations mm-hmm. and you get a discount. That's what happened. So if that is uh, enabling the state capture, then I don't know what really this is. <laughs> it's uh, all about. Yeah, so I was just yeah. uh, uh, unfairly accused. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And then while at ANN7, ANN7 did not do business with government, by the way. Mm-hmm. We gave government ministers opportunities to come and talk about whatever and to talk about. There's not one government department that can say they have spent one cent with NN7. No, there were no government adverts in NN7. You know, so, so, so the total revenue of NN7 in the main came from multi-choice. So we provide content to multi-choice, they pay us a fee. Mm-hmm. That was what, pro, uh, that was a business model. Mm-hmm. So one just gets smeared for nonsense, actually. Uh, because it was really it was no... It a smear campaign. Yeah, it was really. a smear campaign. All the people mm-hmm. that were pro Zuma, they just had to find something. I mean, if you look now, the people that get arrested now, whether it's Mapisa and all of these people that are in trouble, were not in the commission. And yet, these are people with real stuff where yes. they did the mess up. Us, all of us that are, are, are so-called enablers and all of that, not one uh, is in jail. Because it's... it's uh, Zondo allowed people to go and hallucinate in that thing of his. Uh, they come there, they talk all nonsense, and they, they smear people and all of that, and then from there they leave. And then when you go to court, uh, court does not entertain hallucinations. They want evidence. They want facts. If you say, here's a transaction money, in this transaction, he has to kick back, and you are talking, but there's no such. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's why uh, it's not even worth reviewing that thing. You'll just spend money on lawyers, uh, it'd probably be uh, kicked out of court because court will say, we have no time for this nonsense. So, mm-hmm. yeah. And uh, and what's also good, though, is that also in the Criminal Procedure Act, mm-hmm. there's no crime called uh, state capture. So that thing is just a smear campaign. And I've said to the SIU guys, they must uh, unpack this thing called uh, state capture. And mm-hmm. if there's fraud, nail a person for fraud. If there's corruption, nail a person for corruption. Don't come up with these political terms mm-hmm. uh, that have got no legal uh, grounding mm-hmm. uh, and they're all about smearing people. So I think I'm just a victim of a smear campaign. Mm-hmm. Nobody yeah. uh, that can come today and say there's a transaction that is corrupt that man was involved in. Absolutely nobody. And I challenge anybody now. They can go, I've got no skeletons. I know that uh, Comrade Bata said... Uh, <laughs> uh, all of us were well, no skeletons. We are yeah. talking about two comrades the NEC. No skeletons. That's correct. But yeah. uh, uh, I personally can tell you now, mm-hmm. without fear or contradiction, I've got not one skeleton mm-hmm. uh, behind. If there was, trust me, mm-hmm. the way I know the posture of the media is against people like us, mm-hmm. uh, they would have long come up with it. The fact that there's nothing to date, it means absolutely there's nothing. And you? Uh, I, yeah. I, I continue to challenge anybody to go and dig some more. You yeah. won't find anything. Mm-hmm. Do you believe that the Guptas have got the case to answer when it comes to state capture? I I I I I I respect the laws of this country, and uh, I think the Bloemfontein Nulani case mm-hmm. 
Uh, I was listening to that judge there when he was uh, unpacking what actually happened. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not me, it's the judge. Uh, the judge, there were seven people there that that formed the basis of the, uh, there were seven people or eight people that formed the actual basis to charge the Guptas uh, and all of that. Now, if all seven of them were not only found not guilty, but they were acquitted, you mm -hmm. know, to be acquitted is a higher level of not guilty. Mm -hmm. We are acquitted. In other words, people wasted court time, you know, so... I you you I I I I have no uh, what to call it. I've got no capacity to judge anybody. I can only work with what the court has said. So all I can say, in fact, in, all I can say to you is that those that were directly involved with the action, the court has acquitted them. So mm. then the question falls away. And the issue for me, it, which I think, uh, uh, what's this guy uh, Lamula mm -hmm. must uh, take South Africa into his confidence is to say, if he's got warrant of arrest for the Guptas, for instance, he must say, based on which of the crimes, because the primary crime is what the Bloemfontein court said people are acquitted. So I just don't know if he says he's got warrant of arrest or based on what. Perhaps that's why he's even quiet these days about extradition orders and what if you... <laughs> why? Because if you extradite, you must have a guilty verdict Mm -hmm. uh, and all of that. They don't have a guilty verdict and all of that. So I just think it's also another yeah. uh, shenanigan that these guys are doing. So I challenge them. Go and extradite them, uh, extradite them. But as you do, those people that side are going to say, give us a guilty verdict and all of that. And I'm saying the Nulani case probably uh, uh, closed the door on that one, but is too proud to come and tell the nation mm -hmm. that uh, this thing, the wheels are off. Mm -hmm. uh, on their on their case, those who are saying you may be in defense of the Guptas because uh, you may have been closer or working closer to them because you worked with the, the, the former president uh, Jacob Zuma, uh, who had the, the power at the time. What would you say to those who are saying you may be in defense of uh, your allies or your previous? Uh, uh, allies or business allies? I'm not defending them. If the Guptas are guilty, they must come and fry. But I can't pronounce them guilty. Courts must pronounce them guilty. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying to you that courts have not done so. And I'm saying to you, the people that were closer to the action, mm -hmm. courts have acquitted them. So who am I to say anyone is guilty? But if they <laughs> are guilty, uh, they must really fry. Sure. But they can't be pronounced by media yeah. to be guilty. They can't be pronounced by me and you, you know? True. So what am I defending? I'm defending law and order. And I'm saying, if 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 the law had pronounced them guilty, then fine, they must fry. But question is, has the law pronounced them guilty? Answer is a categoric no. no. So yeah. what do you want me to do? Did you have a curry? <laughs> yeah, no, plenty of it, plenty of it, more than Buck's head. Yeah, yeah, there no, by no. Sex and World. Eh? There by Sex and World. Yeah, 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 I've been to that place uh, countless times. Man. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a crime to go there. Been there countless times. They don't eat uh, meat there. It's curry, vegetarian curries and stuff. No, they make very good curries. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, 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 no. Uh, 10 mm. out of 10. Sure. Yeah. Now, you, you worked uh, as the head of GCIS. Yeah. What impact have you made uh, in, at GCIS? And looking at the institution, government communications, uh, would you say at its current form, it's fulfilling its mandate? And what has been your impact? Well, look, I'll give you empirical or something that we can touch. Mm -hmm. Firstly, when I arrived, all the press conferences that were done, the last press conference that was done by Temba Masego was at the union buildings, okay? So when I arrived, within two weeks of arrival at GCIS, I brought everything from the union buildings to GCIS building. Okay. I made GCIS the center of government communication. Otherwise, it was at union buildings. Brought it to GCIS, and they had some long political vision statement uh, of a GCIS, some paragraph vision statement, then I would call them one by one and say, okay, what is the vision of GCIS? Mm. Nobody could recite that thing. I said, it's because it's a paragraph and a political 
nonsense of Nechitense and others <laughs> that they had put into that thing. So I came there and I think it helps to have a corporate background because mm -hmm. things will make them crisp. And we just got there and said, look, what is it that we really want GCIS to be? Mm -hmm. And we said we wanted to be the pulse of government communication. And yeah, that should be the vision of GCIS. It today is still the vision. So every, I still know it even sitting here uh, and all of that, that it should be the pulse of, uh, so it must have all, you must, if you go to GCIS, you must, it must have the answer to all the questions about government. And I believe GCIS uh, continues to do that and all of that. So I think I, I got that uh, sorted, number one. Number two, even managing the building contract of uh, GCIS, where the new building is, of GCIS. There are no shenanigans that are following me after that because there was no corruption. They made sure that uh, everything is where it should be. That contract of GCIS, I read it myself. I didn't give it to lawyers. I read it line by line and I picked up things. I mean, one of the things I picked up in that contract uh, was that uh, if there was a, a leak in the roof, that contract had said uh, that don't take responsibility for that. I said, but what nonsense is this? If you are building uh, and your building is the one that is leaking, and if, the, if, if any leakage happens and the carpets get messed up, the owner of the building must sort it out. And mm -hmm. we got that sorted in the contract. So that contract of GCIS has, has got no issues now because I dedicated my whole energy to make sure that this thing is there for longevity. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that's what uh, happened. And we also, I think the issue of making sure that community media is uh, uh, entertained by government in my era, worked very closely with MDDA, to make sure that community media, small media, alternative oh, media yeah. is engaged uh, in government. In mm -hmm. fact, I would argue that uh, if government had continued with that, government inf communication would reach the masses mm -hmm. uh, because it's not everybody that listens to 702 uh, and uh, SAFM. Other mm -hmm. people listen to regional stations and sure, all of that. Sure. Now, MDD has got a network of these things. GCIS has got studios. Uh, where ministers can come to the studios and plug in at one sitting, can talk to millions of people through those community stations, but they're underutilizing that because it's not sexy to be in these things. Mm -hmm. They want to be in SAFM, they want to be in 702 oh. and all of that. Mm -hmm. Yet they've got the proper infrastructure, which is completely underutilized. There's a studio in Cape Town, there's a studio in Pretoria, completely underutilized. You have to drag them to these things. Mm -hmm. They like going into a hall of 500 people. I say to them, this is not effective. Mm. A hall of 500 people is useless for a millions of people that must hear the message. Talk to the studios, in the studios in GCIS and talk to millions of people. Infrastructure is there. So whilst we're there, we tried to make sure that, uh, in fact, I think in my era, we made sure that the, the, the interaction between GCIS and MDDA is much more solid for mm -hmm. those kinds of things. So, I don't know if it still happens, but I think mm. in my era, yeah. people in the uh, small, medium, medium, small, medium mm -hmm. uh, operators uh, benefited. I mean, there was Bush uh, Radio in the Western Cape, oh, yes. all kinds of other small radio yeah. stations. I think that's when your era gave a rise to a lot of uh, community yeah. radio stations. Yeah, that's, yeah. That, 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 that's what we did. Yeah, yeah. that's and, a meaningful impact indeed. And yeah. Going forward, as the EFF, obviously beyond the 29th of May, when yeah. we take over, yeah. there's going to be serious changes and there's going to be obviously meaningful uh, 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 contribution towards yeah. community well, media. Most definitely, most definitely. Mm -hmm. We'll make sure that that system works properly mm -hmm. uh, as the EFF. Mm -hmm. uh, we would, I mean, the infrastructure is there. Mm -hmm. It's a plug and play. It really can't be complicated, this thing. Mm -hmm. And then you, and you, then you, because what happens is, uh, this space is, is is spoken for. So the big guys, whether it's print media, whether it's uh, electronic media, they try and stop other people. They come up with all kinds of uh, measuring, uh, 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 what, uh, uh, measuring uh, indexes mm -hmm. that make sure that uh, they cut out the small players. So if you are a government department and you have got a developmental objective, mm -hmm. then it's your business to make sure that you assist the small players uh, even if they don't have, in the first instance, the the audience ratings that are required, mm -hmm. but to give them a leg up, that's what we are, that's what government is for. Mm -hmm. But if you are going to have a government that's going to take a corporate culture from day one, a corporate posture from day one, then there's no chance for anybody else. That's why we need a developmental government uh, that is going to 
give people leg up so that people can uh, prosper. Mm -hmm. So EFF government will uh, make sure that uh, all of that is uh, is put to play. Mm -hmm. During your time, you were also a cabinet spokesperson. At the time, you would hear that uh, there's cabinet, this reshuffling of ministers time and again. Some uh, ministers only lasted for, I think, a day or two. <laughs> what are some of the reflections could you share with us in that regard? Yeah, look, uh, the issue of ministers being appointed or removed mm -hmm. is not a cabinet discussion. Cabinet has not even discussed that. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a one man show, if you like. <laughs> prerogative, uh, the president. Yeah, so the, <laughs> yeah. It's a pre they call it prerogative, whatever. But yeah. uh, it's a really a one man show. You just mm -hmm. hear mm -hmm. that uh, this has happened. It, it does. It. I think it's it, it it would not be correct to discuss with cabinet in any event because it would mean that uh, uh, you are you know. Deciding your own fate, mm -hmm. uh, as it were, because maybe you must be removed, uh, but oh, then yeah. you'll be the one talking too much there that that one must be removed and all of that. So it won't work. Mm -hmm. So it's never a cabinet discussion. It's a, a presidential uh, duty mm -hmm. to appoint the cabinet and all of that. They do their consultations uh, with whoever they need to consult with, but the decision and accountability lies with the executive authority. The constitution does not make room for any of these uh, other other things. Uh, mm -hmm. They just put the power, the executive authority to run government vests with the president. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and therefore, uh, yeah, he, he, he or she must uh, uh, put men and women there that uh, can do the job. Were the Guptas consulted? They? Were the Guptas consulted? <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know. I because wouldn't you would know. then communicate government's, uh, you know, decisions because you were the spokesperson. Of government. Yeah. You see, this is. Uh, let me help you with understanding my role. Mm -hmm. There is a, a presidential spokesperson. Mm -hmm. I was not that. Mm -hmm. I was a cabinet spokesperson. So my things that I, com I used to communicate are mm -hmm. to do with cabinet as a collective. Mm -hmm. I was not even so-called government spokesperson where you speak for each of the government departments. Yeah. Each government department has got its own sp spokesperson. Mm -hmm. So a GCIS is a cabinet spokesperson. You speak once in two weeks mm -hmm. because that's cabinet meets fortnightly. So that's what you do. And then you can clarify things in between. But your actual press briefings are once in two weeks every fortnight. Mm -hmm. uh, you do that, but it's for the collective, mm -hmm. uh, as it were. So things about ministers being appointed and all of that are not cabinet decisions. So it's not within the space of a cabinet spokesperson to deal with that. Mm -hmm. Maybe a spokesperson of the president, yes. uh, we can ask that question to that person, not not cabinet spokesperson. Yeah. yeah. So when did you actually get into the political arena? When did your politics in, 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 in uh, politics really start? Yeah. Look, I think the organization that must get credit for my politicization is actually the Black Management Forum, the BMF, not even the ANC, the BMF. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I've been in the BMF since uh, the early 80s and all of that. Uh, so it was uh, it, it's an organization that really shaped me, uh, even politically, uh, in the BMF. But in the ANC, I joined the ANC after unbanning. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can show you that uh, I don't have the so-called struggle credentials, skipping the country and all of that. And I also don't apologize for that because the group of the people that went there, some of them were actually spies and all of that. Uh, so I'm happy that I'm not mired uh, in that controversy of spies and all of that. I was here in the country uh, receiving hot claps of the Boers and all of that. So I was part of... Uh, people of South Africa fighting for their liberation uh, as it were in the country. I never left the country. So that's the first thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, in Velko, while I was there, we used to attend uh, what we used to call MDM meetings, Mass Democratic Movement meetings and all of that. I think out of contributions in those meetings, some of the comrades identified me to say, uh, maybe I should run for uh, the Youth League chairpersonship at the time. So I ran for that and I got it. So I can say that uh, my first political appointment was being a chairperson of the youth okay. league around the 92s, 93, mm -hmm. somewhere in that space sure. and all of that. And as I say, 
that some of the people that are served with they are still alive oh. uh, and okay. all of that yeah. oh tembingo sim kalipi mm. and all of that yeah oh. so that's really yeah uh, and but, those are the people who showed you the ropes in fact <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah but you see for instance the reason my children today mm-hmm. don't have uh, and my first born was born 1985 so when my first born was born uh, he doesn't have an english name it's just because oh, okay. i was already conscientized way back then So not one of the all have two same names. Same here, same uh, here. Yeah. I do African names. <laughs> yeah. They have two names but yeah. all of them are all African names. Okay. And all of that. So mm-hmm. that's my evidence to show my politicization started way before I got involved with the ANC mm-hmm. and all of that. And uh, and in 1992 I was also part of the uh, ready to govern thing at Nasrec of the ANC. Mm-hmm. So I've really uh, uh, had my nails deep into Uh, particularly policy issues of the ANC. I was very interested in those uh, kinds of things and uh, because I just believe that if we have a constitutional democracy uh, kind of thing, uh, then the rule of law yeah. is going to be supreme. Therefore, the rules must make sense. So I then uh, use my energy in things that have to do with policy, regulations and all of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so that's really uh, how I started. Yeah. And um, you talking about policy, and you were so much interested in the policies of the ANC. And as you'd understand, the ANC uh, is in alliance with SACP. And um, I remember Nelson Mandela was quite vocal um, on issues of uh, land, the policy on, on land. In fact, I just want us to play an insight on what Nelson Mandela had to say. The ANC does not believe in, in socialism. We are a broad national movement which combines the various strands of political thought, ranging from the far right to the extreme left, uh, embracing uh, liberal and conservative views. And uh, if you study our basic policy document, the Freedom Charter, you will find that it is based on free enterprise. And the land, for example, there is no nationalization of the land. And um, uh, the land is subject to individual ownership. And um, in actual fact, when the freedom charter is applied when the provisions of the freedom charters are applied uh, capitalism amongst africans will flourish as never before i wrote an article in 1956 to this effect uh, to say private enterprise when we a democratic system is introduced will flourish in this country as never before and um, The only exception is a clause which calls for the nationalization of the mines, the financial institutions, and monopolies. That is done because of the conditions in the country. It's a clause which was actually adopted in the constitution of the present ruling National Party in the 40s. So there is nothing unique in that. There is no element of socialism in the policy of the ANC, whatever may happen in the future. So what do you make of what Mandela had to say yeah. regarding Look, the policies of the ANC and its type of time yeah. lines? Yeah, I think, um, President, in fact, the correct pronunciation even of his name is Mandela. Mandela. I know that they've called Mandela. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's Mandela. Okay. Yeah, so President Mandela... Um, In, he, he, he has a clip that, in fact, I've just seen recently. I didn't know about this clip. I must admit uh, the clip where he talks about uh, the posture of the ANC on issues. Mm-hmm. That, that, that clip, it actually is a, a perfect portrayal of the ANC as a neoliberal organization. Uh, in the, I mean, you can hear uh, President Mandela himself, uh, you know, uh, talking highly of capitalism. Mm. and being categoric 
about not being a socialist organization, mm. as it were. You can also hear him uh, uh, rubbishing, basically, the issue of the land uh, as understood by all revolutionaries. And hear, hear him uh, talking more about private ownership of the land, you know, stuff like that. Uh, this is when you realize that the South African Communist Party must accept that it has failed to influence the ANC towards their socialism agenda. And I don't understand why they are still in that alliance because ever since they started with the ANC, they have never really succeeded to influence the ANC towards uh, socialism. Mm. Uh, as it were. That's why we have this uh, uh, mess that we have now. Yeah, so indeed, um, uh, if anybody wants to know uh, as to who, which organization is best placed to take over uh, the fight which our kings and queens in the 1800s, 1700s were fighting uh, against colonialism, it's the, only the EFF. The EFF has got no, uh, uh, what to call it, does not uh, sympathize with imperialism. Mm -hmm. EFF is very clear mm -hmm. about uh, its issues around the land. Uh, and I think the important thing really about the EFF there, it's not, EFF is not even saying chase anybody away, no. It just simply says, this is a God-given thing to everybody in South Africa. So therefore, the state must be the custodian of this. Of and the utilization must be optimum. Mm -hmm. uh, utilization, if you're using it optimally, FF is not going to bother you. But if you're using the land uh, for just keeping it fallow, you're not using it, you just want to hit your chest that this is my <laughs> land, uh, then work. it must be taken and <laughs> sure. be put, put to best, best use for the country. So, so yeah, I think... Uh, 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 that man, that that clip must show South Africa that uh, the time for the ANC uh, should not even have started. In fact, I would argue that uh, if we had time, I would go through the whole thing just to show you that, in fact, truth mm -hmm. be told, the ANC was actually a scam, mm -hmm. uh, if you ask me. So it was actually a scam, and it has actually delayed the transformation of this country. I mean, if you can look now, I mean, why would you have... Why would we have in the constitution of this of the country uh, a cutoff in terms of uh, issues around around uh, land distribution and restitution? Where they put a cutoff date of 19 June, uh, 1913. Basically, the ANC has agreed that all the land that were robbed from 1652 mm -hmm. until 19 June, 1913, you must forget about that land. Mm -hmm. The only discussion starts from 1913 which were just a few farms uh, here and there. So you can see that this organization's Porsche uh, is a sellout organization. I mean, yeah. why would they in 1994 reverse even something that was progressive done by Fervut? You know Fervut with all his faults, but in 1961, Fervut got South Africa to be sovereign mm -hmm. uh, state, not to be part of the monarchy and everything. Mm -hmm. 1994, the ANC's first decision was to take us back into the clutches of the imperialism mm -hmm. and join the Commonwealth. As we see it here and now, South Africa is a puppet state. You know, the when when the EFF, in fact, talks about our 2024 is our 1994, that statement is very deep and it's very important to really understand because we would have thought that in 1994 we got political freedom and the EFF is going to bring economic freedom. No, the task for the EFF is bigger. Mm. We actually don't have even political freedom. ANC is in the political office. They are not in political power. No. If they had the power, they would have done a lot of things. They've got no power. They are in office. They get instructions from the establishment. They get mm. instructions from somewhere. They actually are not in power. So the challenge for the EFF going forward is not only economic emancipation, it's political emancipation emancipation as well, so that political decisions uh, can be taken. Mm -hmm. So that's really the, the, uh, uh, the situation that we find ourselves. So I think uh, South Africa is lucky mm -hmm. to have an organization like the EFF. The EFF. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, because the ANC-led government, surely it's leading people um, into something else because they even worship uh, the late Queen uh, Elizabeth. I yeah. mean, they, our president I went mean, there to attend. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, you know, you uh, know, you know, you uh, know, let me tell you something. Mm -hmm. And and this is not being spoken about and analyzed a lot. Mm -hmm. 
the fact that all presidents of this country will fail, they all have to wear that uh, uh, bath, uh, that thing that they give them, uh, in, in the queen gives them, or the king gives them mm -hmm. uh, in England. Uh, that thing, they are knighted, they are knights. Mm -hmm. uh, these uh, presidents of this country are knights of the, of the British crown. Mm -hmm. Now, when you are a knight of the British crown, you have a duty to your principal, uh, as it were. So, so, so the reason we're not making progress here is because we are led by knights of the British crown. Mm -hmm. So their first allegiance is to their principal. This is why things don't move. Because, I mean, if you look at even our economy, um, mm -hmm. our economy is not moving because South Africa has become a place where you, you, you just take raw material oh, yeah. and take it uh, to the monarchy. I mean, right now, the queen, they is sitting with more gold than we have gold in South Africa, and they've got no gold mines there. And this is the model uh, mm. that, uh, we, uh, that we have. Now, if you had uh, an organization like the EFF in charge, one of the things that the EFF has said is that when we take power, we're going to stop those trucks uh, that go to Richards Bay. We're going to do a roadblock, it's going to stop, and we're going to beneficiate here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and then sell them uh, finished goods. That's what must happen. If uh, anything, and it doesn't mean we're not going to have international cooperation, we will. These firms must come here and set up shop here so that we can have uh, employment here. We must not export jobs. We must come set up shop here, employ our people here, build the, 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 the economy, build, uh, beneficiate all our products, be it agricultural products, be it uh, minerals and all of those things. Mm -hmm. There must be... Um, a beneficiated here. So that's what uh, the EFF government would do. Mm. So these are some of the reasons why you, should I say, ran away? <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> From yeah. the ANC. No, the reason I, I left the ANC <laughs> is because after realization that, okay, there was a mess up uh, in all these years, mm -hmm. and then there was a decision taken in 2017 that meant just do a step change and fix the mess as it were. This is why the decision or res progressive resolutions like uh, expropriation of land without compensation, like nationalization of the Reserve Bank and, 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 and uh, conversion of a uh, 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 post bank into a state bank, mm -hmm. all of those things. So all of those decisions were, were taken. Then instead, come 2018, Mm -hmm. uh, when you, people start to pronounce on this, then you have people that are appointed in those various roles, like a governor of the Reserve Bank, mm -hmm. Tito Mbuen at the time would say, you're talking nonsense, that's not going to happen, mm -hmm. uh, and all of that. And mm -hmm. then you have the, 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 the president of the country uh, backing him up on that. Then I decided, well, what is this now? Mm -hmm. The last time I checked was that uh, the ANC was the center of power. What the ANC says, it must happen. Now we have the ANC saying one thing, uh, progressive in their conference, but the deployed cadres of the ANC that must make it happen in government do something different. Then I decided that actually the organization has ended. There's no longer the ANC uh, as I, have, I had understood it all these years because there was nothing more sacrosanct in the ANC than the resolutions of the conference. Mm -hmm. Now, if and it's one thing to be to, to be delayed in implementing the resolutions, mm -hmm. but it's another to speak against the resolutions of the conference. I mean, this current NEC, they even amend some of the resolutions of the conference, and yet, in terms of their own democratic centralism, once the higher structure is decided. NEC is subservient yeah, to the conference. Only but, the conference but, that can, you know, make I mean, the step aside thing as an example mm -hmm. was twisted by the NEC in between conferences. They have no power to do this. Then you realize that this thing has uh, deteriorated. So that's why I decided that, nah, enough for me. Let me move on. And uh, then I joined ATM at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason I joined ATM, by the way, uh, more than anything else, is because it was a uh, post chartered an organization that has got all the churches that had signed up. Uh, I understood the TACC to be having 6 million people. Mm -hmm. I understood the CC to be part of this. I understood Shembe to be part of this. Mm -hmm. I understood Bantu Church of Christ to be part mm -hmm. of this. Then I looked at the numbers. I said, okay, get this right. Yeah, This is going to be the new government. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I got in there, uh, other things happened, and I don't know what they said to those other churches. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, before we knew, it was not like that, and all of that. So, otherwise, there's absolutely nothing wrong with the ATM. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. But I left the ATM as well because I just thought that uh, the critical mass, which I thought they were going to have quickly, they don't have. Uh, and the organization that has got the critical mass to make meaningful changes, the EFF, mm -hmm. if you look at the number of public reps that the EFF has at all levels of government, uh, whether it's local, whether it's provincial, whether it's uh, national, the EFF has got that critical mass. So if you're looking for a, a here and now organization, mm -hmm. that's the EFF. So that's why I end up with the EFF. But by the way, also, my uh, ideology, uh, or BMF ideology and the EFF are not very different, actually. Uh, way back in the 2011, 2012, around that space when I was still president of the BMF, mm -hmm. there used to be a lot of convergence with the Malema Youth League of the ANC sure, sure. Uh, of the time. They would say something, would back it up, would say something, they'd back it up. So there's, there's always been that alignment. Mm -hmm. So uh, 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 when I came to the EFF, it was really a natural place for me. I, I, do, I don't have to be anybody else to be in the EFF. It's just going to be me. Uh, so when I'm becoming me, uh, I become, uh, I, 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 I think I come seamlessly into the EFF uh, because ideologically there's a hundred percent alignment. Sure. Yeah. And when you joined the EFF, you said you are aging other professionals to, yeah. to follow suit. Yeah. You see, it's important for professionals to come to the organization like the EFF mm -hmm. because the, what we need in the EFF is to make sure that the brain power that is already in place is augmented so that this thing can move properly in the EFF. I mean, this whole thing about superior logic and all of that, it means the issues of reading, research, and analysis uh, is mm -hmm. key in the EFF. We don't just do emotional decisions. So for that to happen uh, on a consistent level, you need a lot more people that are studious in their approach, mm -hmm. that are scholarly in their approach. Uh, and this is, what, this is what professionals do. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons, by the way, I, I in the in the in the ANC days, I actually started this thing called the Progressive Professionals Forum. Okay. It's because I came to the same realization that actually, uh, if because you would go to the ANC conference and all the professionals would be put in a corner there called deployed cadres, and they would sit there and not really participate in the conference, mm -hmm. and it would be the guys from branches. Uh, not that they are not professionals in the branches, but there'll be guys from branches <laughs> sure. that run the show. Mm -hmm. But the people with data and research and everything that are running government institutions, you CEOs of state-owned enterprises, your DGs, they would sit quietly in this one corner. If you are not a member of a branch, you just sit there and watch the conference and you can see that actually if you had an opportunity, you could do this and all of that. Uh, but the space there uh, does not allow you because when the guys speak there, the first thing they say is, uh, Chair, this is me from this branch, from this region, and in our AGM. Mm -hmm. So you can see that uh, people pull their muscle. You stand up there as a deployed decade. Uh, it's like you're, you're speaking for a jacket. So people just decide to just keep quiet. So I started the PPF mm -hmm. to say professionals must uh, take them out of the idle mode and all of that. So in the, in the EFF, that concept of the PPF mm -hmm. is integrated into the entire organization. Mm -hmm. The EFF is a pro-professionals. This is why even in the list process, there's issues about how many graduates, how many mm -hmm. PhDs, how many of, because the EFF realizes the need for professionals. So the statement I was making mm -hmm. is properly aligned mm -hmm. with the posture of the EFF towards uh, thought leadership on issues, research on issues, uh, substantive uh, submissions, mm -hmm. not just howling. Yeah, so, <laughs> not yeah. just howling. Yeah. Earlier on, you touched on the issue of African names. Yeah. Uh, you were known as uh, Jimmy. Yes. Why did you switch from <laughs> Jimmy to <laughs> <laughs> now? Yeah, no, look, uh, I think um, the people that must get credit for this are the Fees Must Fall uh, <laughs> students. Yeah. Those activists, in fact, before Fees Must Fall, I think for me, they started with the roads must fall. Sure. Uh, so when they started the roads must fall thing, which migrated to fees must fall, that's when I just, you know, because we've got many priorities, uh, then this was not uh, high on my priority list. But when the roads must fall and I then uh, revived my uh, activism uh, in my head, I said, yeah, actually, the reason I have this name, Jimmy, was to make it easy for the white men to call my name. 
so at this day and age, if you can't say Mzwanele, then tough. Uh, <laughs> so I had to remove this name yeah. because actually it's a, it's, it's a slave name. Uh, it's a slave name is to ensure that uh, uh, the boss can call you. Uh, my parents were trying to make it easy for me so that uh, the boss must, uh, must not have uh, this problem. But fortunately, both my parents are late now, so I'm not offending anyone alive. Uh, so I decided, no, I removed this uh, slave name. I've mm-hmm. even removed it from my ID officially. Is it? Yeah, so it's okay. not there. So if you call me Jimmy, I don't even look at you. <laughs> On Twitter, if you call me Jimmy, I block you oh. immediately because I've announced this so many sure, times. Sure. So if you continue to call me Jimmy, you are actually enslaving me. Uh, so I see it as a, uh, as a provocation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so call me Jimmy, I block you. <laughs> Story, I don't even argue. Yeah. So, I mean, people that will listen to this podcast will try me and put Jimmy. We're not going to argue. That will be the last time you're on my timeline. Call me Jimmy, I block you. Mm. Uh, so, that's what I do. Yeah, yeah. they must tread carefully. <laughs> <laughs> Are you still yeah. the spokesperson of the Jacob Zuma Foundation? If so, what are some of the lessons that you may have learned in working with uh, the former president, Jacob Zuma? Yeah, no. President Zuma is a very uh, interesting man. You know, mm-hmm. uh, I've learned a lot. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah. I've really learned a lot from <laughs> sure, him. Sure. And I think, you know, uh, people in South Africa confuse the issue of uh, education, formal education with one's cognitive abilities. My argument is that what education does, uh, it does two things. First, mm-hmm. it gives the training. Uh, number one. Number two, it uh, measures your cognitive capabilities. Uh, it can be NQF up to NQF 10. It mm-hmm. measures that. So President Zuma has not been measured uh, in terms of those NQFs. Now, purely because people, because has not been measured, mm-hmm. he hasn't got an NQF this or NQF that, he has not been measured. It must not be assumed that he therefore is an NQF zero. No. He could very well be NQF 12, NQF 15. Uh, Because if you look at the things that he does, he's always five steps ahead of the crowd. So it means that uh, the fact that you have not been measured does not mean you don't have the cognitive capability. Mm -hmm. And also the fact that he didn't receive formal education, his thinking is not programmed. There is nothing as easy as predicting an educated guy Mm -hmm. because you know that that person is programmed this way. So if you want to catch this person, this is what to do. If you want to uh, preempt this person, what to do, this is what he's going to do, and all of that. But President Zuma does not operate from any program. Uh, he wakes up and he says, okay, we're going to do it this way. He would have thought it through in his own processing, but his processing is not your X, Y, axis. It's something else. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's why um, even doctors, they're trailing behind him in terms of understanding uh, what the man does. So I think uh, we must uh, grow and understand that uh, uh, formal education, yes, is important mm-hmm. and all of that, mm-hmm. but don't write off people that don't have formal education. They've got wisdom, they've got years behind them, they've got experiences, they've got different approaches to life and all of, the, and all of that. I mean, if you look at Africans as an example, Africans with their indigenous knowledge system, uh, they were able to make spears out of uh, sure. uh, iron ore and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and an educated guy will tell you that you need a furnace oh. of 11,000 degrees Celsius and all of this, <laughs> and without that, it yeah. cannot be done. But Africans used to do it. Indigenous so, knowledge. So indigenous knowledge systems, is mm-hmm. a, a lot of what President Zuma uses, indigenous knowledge systems. And I think it, the EFF should adopt this, uh, indigenous knowledge systems. It will give us an edge. Uh, because it gives us something which no other nation has, mm. and it gives you a cutting edge in thinking, uh, in processing things. So it's mm-hmm. a, it's it's a way to go. Yeah, his imprisonment after he failed to attend the state uh, state capture commission of inquiry. Do you think it was well deserved? No, no. I mean, you, if firstly the fact that there was no unanimous decision should tell you that even judges, some of the judges did not think it's the right thing to do. Uh, I mean, if you remember Kampepe, the, the very first thing that she said is that, okay, uh, we're not going to follow normal processes and, and procedures because we're dealing with uh, uh, an exceptional case. I mean, if you say that, then it means we are going to be arbitrary uh, because in, in South Africa, you have uh, law and order. Mm-hmm. You've got lower courts and all of that. Mm-hmm. 
and we have in the constitution something about we should not be detained without a trial. Sure. President Zuma did not have a trial, mm-hmm. uh, as it were. And a trial only happens in a trial court. Mm-hmm. It doesn't happen in a constitutional court. So President Zuma was denied the opportunity to have a, a trial because in a trial, then the witnesses called, there would be cross-examination. None of that happened. They just decided that this guy, that no, this one, they preempted him. They said, so no, he's going, to, he's going to react like this. Oh, If you do yeah. this based on his previous uh, reactions, based on his letters, he, he's already told us this, so there's no point. Mm-hmm. Let's just nail the bugger. That's what they did. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then even the sentencing of that thing, uh, the sentencing of uh, uh, um, uh, co- uh, contempt of court is mm-hmm. already regulated. They went over that. I mean, Bota, uh, who also had an issue around respecting um, uh, court orders and all of that, mm-hmm. he got uh, some regulated sentence, which was a no-brainer to deal with it. But because it's President Zoom, they decided to have what I would call a Zuma law. And they just made a special law for him that when, uh, even though we're a civil contempt, uh, we're going to deal, we're going to treat you like a criminal uh, 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 inmate. Mm-hmm. And, and, and even, even at criminal inmates, Uh, he's the only criminal inmate that did not go to trial. All others went to trial. So indeed, I think uh, it continues to be an injustice that was done on him. Mm-hmm. And now he has um, established uh, MK, which is giving the ANC sleepless nights. Yeah. And the AN, I think the MK Youth League has touted him to become their presidential uh, candidate. What's your take on that? Yeah, look, I, 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 I think uh, it's not always wise to talk about other parties mm-hmm. uh, using a platform of another party, but mm-hmm. uh, we wish them well, whatever they do. And I think uh, let them do whatever they, they, they want to do. The important thing for us as the EFF is that we are, we are gunning for more than 50%. We are mm-hmm. gunning for 51% as the EFF who want to run this country. And we think as the EFF, we've got already capacity mm-hmm. in all the regions Uh, and I think if one looks at the show that EFF has been having around these manifestos without passing people from other provinces, the EFF has shown with empirical evidence that we've got a solid uh, footholding uh, in every province. Eastern Cape is known yeah. as the province of the legends. Look at the masses that were there. And I can tell massive. you now, was I was massive. in that uh, region, I can tell you now that Not everyone that was there, uh, not everyone that wanted to be there was there. Some of the uh, areas could not go there because of all kinds of uh, transport problems. Uh, had those people arrived, I don't know what would have happened in that place. Uh, and they are very angry with the organizers that uh, wanted to come and all of this. Uh, the Alfred, I think the Alfred and Zoe area, not everyone wanted to be here. Some thousands of people that were left stranded and uh, the organization must deal with that. But I'm mm-hmm. just saying mm-hmm. that people that were there, uh, massive as they were, it's not all that people, it's not all of the people that would have been there had all the logistics been in place. So indeed, I think even in the Eastern Cape where the ANC is the strongest mm-hmm. because it has already lost KZN, <laughs> we're dealing with it in the Eastern Cape now. And I think uh, uh, we have a good chance to to take over the Eastern Cape as well. Mm-hmm. So I think... Uh, The EFF is really the future. If you just leave emotions out and look at empirical evidence, you look, I mean, uh, in uh, all the surveys, all the Ipsos uh, surveys, there's no survey uh, in the country that says EFF is going to drop. No survey mm-hmm. says that all of them uh, is pointing up. So indeed, I think uh, we we yeah. can only argue what percentage and all of that, but mm-hmm. uh, EFF is the one party that is growing in leaps and bounds. So mm-hmm. I think if you want certainty about who is to govern, mm-hmm. look no further than the EFF. Absolutely, because we are on an upward uh, trajectory. Yeah. Yeah. And now we are dipping into public uh, procurement, yeah. which is prone to corruption. Yeah. Uh, if I may take you back to COVID-19, yeah. there were scandals about uh, PPE tenders. How will the EFF government uh, do things differently yeah. as far as uh, public procurement is concerned? Yeah. Look, The, the starting point is that you can't call yourself government, but you're depending on everybody else to do your core functions. Mm-hmm. If you call yourself government, if mm-hmm. you want people to respect you as a government, 
It must be a government that can deliver uh, and all of that. So the EFS posture on public procurement is that in the first instance, government must build capacity to deliver services itself. Uh, the EFF will, for instance, establish its own construction company. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to build schools, you must not appoint anyone. You must say, hey, so-and-so, tomorrow go build a school there uh, and all of that. There's no tender that must waste time, mm -hmm. six months trying to decide who must get what, who must get what kickback. It must be a government department that does that. So EFF will have a construction company that will build, uh, build schools, will build roads and all of that. EFF will have its own pharmaceutical company. If that was, if the COVID had hit us in the EFF ruling era, we wouldn't have made these uh, uh, pharmaceuticals rich because EFF would have had, would have had its own pharmaceutical uh, company. And this EFF had said, right on its founding manifesto, I'm not saying this uh, because after the fact, it's been thought through. Now you can imagine if that was followed and mm -hmm. EFF had its own pharmaceutical company. So it's going to have that. It's going to have its own mining uh, company uh, so that to make sure that uh, at least, and we're not cutting out others, but there must be a critical mass of uh, mineral production, mineral processing that the state is doing itself. will allow the private sector, obviously, to do whatever they can, but government must have its own uh, foot in the, uh, in the door in terms of doing this, even in banking, and all of that. So, so the, and, and this is why in the EFF we talk about uh, attracting more professionals because for all of this to run smoothly, mm -hmm. you need professionals uh, to do this. So procurement from where we sit will then be left to maybe consumables uh, as it were. We're not going to start here uh, to start manufacturing brooms uh, for cleaners. No, a broom <laughs> manufacturing company must do that, sure. but will insource cleaners Uh, make sure that cleaners, government must employ its own cleaners. But if you want to have a soap, we'll go to a company that manufactures soap and all of that. All the things that to help us, uh, all the ancillary services will be procured. But core function of government must be done by government. So in a nutshell, that's a portion of the of, of the mm -hmm. of the EFF. And and what that does, it actually becomes a revenue generator. Oh. Number one, this way. Mm -hmm. Number one, you, you cut out corruption. If you were to quantify the level of corruption just by doing things the EFF way, corruption is gone immediately, overnight. You don't have to be chasing a Saudi here and another one there for all kinds of millions mm -hmm. because there would not have been an opportunity for those uh, reckless tendering and kickbacks and all this nonsense that would happen. Already that becomes a revenue generator, number one. Number two... Because government is outsourcing and all of that, you pay for somebody to pay for people. I mean, you, you look at security as, as an example or even cleaners as an example. You pay a company to uh, a bit vest or some company to, uh, uh, to do the cleaning services for you. That company, out of the 10,000 that you pay, uh, the actual cleaner gets maybe 2,000. The 8,000... Uh, is for the company directors to buy the Mercedes-Benz and large offices and what have you. Whereas if you're taking that whole resource and you, you, you make sure that people have got decent employment, they've got medical aid, they've got pension funds, they've got all these things, it then makes for a better quality of life. So, so the posture of the EFF also supports the issue of building the quality of life of the citizens of the country and everybody working for the state must be properly paid You must not feel like when you are working for the state, uh, you are going to get uh, worse off in terms of remuneration. Sure. State must pay market-related salaries and all of that to make sure that there's dignity all around. Mm -hmm. So that's what the EFF would do. And of course, uh, one of the uh, pillars, of non-negotiable pillars of the EFF is that tenders will be abolished, yeah. which will obviously deal Uh, immediately with the issues of uh, bribery. Now we yeah. understand the the, yeah. the Speaker of uh, Parliament is in hot water. Nosivio Mapisa Nakula, she's accused of taking bribes. So the EFF's uh, posture on ending uh, uh, tenders will precisely deal with these issues. Yeah, most 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 definitely. I mean, <laughs> uh, I mean, if you look now, uh, even before you go to Mapisa Nakula and the the shenanigans there, mm -hmm. the Commission. 
uh, that was supposed to investigate corruption. It was on a private sector building, which, I mean, imagine how many millions were paid mm -hmm. to that company mm -hmm. when in parallel there are empty government offices that could have been used to house the Zondo Commission. How many millions did you waste there uh, on, uh, on that company, yeah. you know? So, so on, on that commission, all, all that infrastructure, and it's not like government doesn't have this. I mean, even if you were to go to a, a, a green building yeah. of Derko, yeah. there's enough space there. And you there. talked about the infrastructure, yeah. GCIS, got, which is GCIS has got the infrastructure, sure. but Derko's infrastructure for the kind of thing that the commission was doing is perfect. So there's no shortage, but it's just that the mentality of government of wanting to procure yeah, this capacity, useless. but it's not yeah. used. <laughs> it, it, I mean, w when I was DJ of Flavor, by the way, uh, I get there and uh, I, I asked the guy, uh, I think a chief director of economics to do some market this and that, market analysis mm -hmm. on labor. Then he says, okay, uh, he'll, 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 he'll put together some uh, tender proposals. He says, for what now? He says, no, for companies that must come and do this thing. So chief, but where now we've got a master's in economics. Why is it not you doing this? What are you there here for? So that's what happens. Government professionals have been turned into coordinators. These are highly professional people. So I can tell you now, at the Department of Labor, I changed that. Uh, the chief director at the time that was there with the uh, master's in sure. uh, economics, mm -hmm. he was the one that was producing the reports that we're using to say whatever we need to say. We didn't need to outsource that. So that's the mentality that must change. Yeah, so the EFF will make sure that professionals in government do exactly that. They don't become professional coordinators. Uh, you sit there with a master's and all you do is to coordinate mm -hmm. uh, other professionals. Some of them are even less qualified than you, mm -hmm. but that's the culture uh, of doing things, you know? So yeah, so EFF will change all of that and make sure everything is in source. I mean, even Stats SA, a lot of what Stats SA does, uh, should, there should be nothing outsourced uh, to anyone. Must all be government employees uh, and all of that, so that you, you also maintain mm -hmm. the credibility of the information. You also don't have IP issues. You know, everything is owned by a government. You don't sit there with some service provider that is going to um, uh, uh, claim mm -hmm. that uh, they must sell you now the IP and everything after doing the work for you. So all of those things, uh, with the approach of the EFF of building internal capacity, mm -hmm. they get dealt with, and then we have a much more efficient state. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, by the way, yeah, uh, it then also, actually, it builds the economy. Because then what then happens that even the state uh, 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 officials that are there, now they've got more money to do whatever they need to do. Uh, then uh, they can spend, they can do this. And as you do that, uh, the multiplier effect of that is that uh, check us gets uh, more customers that can can fill up the trolley, not uh, customers that are going to come with just their hand uh, basket. Then you've got a lot more people that can drive the economy. So this only makes sense mm -hmm. that even though it might look like you want to own everything, but at the end of the day, it's good for the building uh, of the economy of the country. Mm. How will the EFF government reposition state-owned companies such as ESCOM, SAA. If you think of ESCOM, load shading, serious problems yeah. there. SAA, now we understand the, the deal between SAA and uh, Takatso. It's now, um, Parliament has referred that to the SIU to further investigate how did this deal uh, come about. How will then an EFF government uh, reposition these state-owned uh, companies to ensure that they are effective. They provide the necessary goods and services in the in the public interest. Yeah. Look, I think firstly is the mental posture that uh, must be there. Mm -hmm. The EFF mental posture is a correct one to say those state-owned enterprises mm -hmm. must continue to be state-owned enterprises mm -hmm. because then the motive is different. Mm -hmm. The motive is service delivery. The motive is for the long haul. But if you outsource, you privatize these companies, uh, then they get into the hands whose motive is just profit uh, and, and, and all of that. So they normalize poverty um, uh, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the scheme of things. Mm -hmm. Now, with the, with the EFF government, in fact, I think even electricity can be free for, 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 for residents because 
the amount of uh, megawatts that you need for residents is very, 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 very uh, peanuts. It's very small, very minuscule. The big uh, energy generators, actually big firms, uh, mining companies oh. and all of that. So these are the people that must carry the, the cost of the electricity burden, mm-hmm. uh, as it were. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can't have indigent people that are busy trying to pay for electricity and water and all of this. Mm-hmm. Where must they get their money from? So with the EFF government, we're, and we're not being irresponsible by this, we're just simply saying, even for those people, to, for them to be in an economically uplifted place, uh, basic services must be provided. It mustn't be a wonder to open a tap and get water. It must be. This mustn't be a wonder to press it on the wall. And electricity comes on. This must be just a, a given, a, mm-hmm. as it were. Then we have these big companies that must pay for this and all of that. And if you, if you, if your companies are not are not, are not problematic, as long as you supply them with electricity, uh, uh, they will pay mm-hmm. uh, those companies uh, with, with uh, uh, the electricity to provide them. So, so for for the EFF, for instance, with ESCOM. What we are saying with ESCOM, as an example, is that the issue of uh, base load uh, being supplied by coal is going to be priority. And we sit here in South Africa with uh, over 200 years of um, coal reserves. So we're not about to run out of coal in this country. Sure, sure. So we can use that, but at the same time, we can do that coal in a responsible way. We're not saying we're going to uh, make the country smoky. No. We then invest in clean burn technology. Mm-hmm. Some of these new plants of ESCOM already have this uh, clean burn technology. So we're going to have clean burn technology to make sure that we don't pollute, number one. Number two, we can also use nuclear. Nuclear is clean energy. We can also use gas and all of that. And maybe these uh, IPPs, we're not against them uh, per, per, per se, but what we're saying is that they can't be in the mainstream, really. Maybe what they should be reserved for is for household uh, put uh, solar panels in the housing uh, and what have you. Maybe that's as far as they should be used. But uh, and, and the reason for that is because when we are in industry, when you are a metal wanting to burn steel, and when we need that electricity, mm-hmm. the, the ESCOM must respond to the demand. And base load electric generation responds to the demand. But... Uh, these renewables, they don't respond to demand. They respond to weather, you know. Uh, you say, uh, Mr. Um, Mr. Wind Energy, mm-hmm. give me energy. Oh, sorry, today I've got no wind. Mm. Mr. Solar, can you give me energy today? Oh, sorry, it's raining. There's no sun. I can't help you. Mm-hmm. What do you do as a firm? But if you say, Mr. Cole, sure. give me energy. You say how much? That's the mm-hmm. only question that you answer. How much? But I'm going to give you. Mm-hmm. Same with the nuclear. Same with the gas. So those for us will be the key drivers of the uh, sustainable energy generation. Mm-hmm. And the the uh, renewables as a top up. Uh, sure. I mean, I mean, look now. They when they were doing these uh, IPPs, they said we're going to have some seven thousand megawatts. Uh, but if you go to the Twitter page of the ESCOM today and you look at what we're averaging with these IPPs, put all of them put together, mm-hmm. it's like 1,500 megawatts. So it's not anywhere near what you've been promised. So it's a real um, pinning up your hopes on some imaginary thing that is not going to happen. This is why even Europe is uh, here in the country. Their coal um, um, consumption of South Africa has quadrupled, uh, and they are already dismantling they are renewable uh, things of uh, 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 wind and, and, and solar and all mm-hmm. of that because it's not sustainable sure. and all that. So, yeah. So, why so, is South Africa yeah. dropping what is sustainable and yeah. replacing with something that's also, it's, it's, it's got no brain? Yeah. So, we've got a brainless government. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, talking, as it is. talking about brain, brainless uh, government, uh, Minister of Public Enterprises, uh, Minister Godan uh, Jamnandes, has been at the helm of these uh, ailing uh, state uh, enterprises yeah. or uh, companies. How would you describe his tenure in public service? Mediocrity? Disastrous. <laughs> Disastrous. In fact, I think the, the decision even to get rid of that uh, department is the right decision. Mm-hmm. To say all those uh, state-owned enterprises must revert to their line departments. It's just an, an, an unnecessary layer. I mean, 
I know that it, SAA is an example when that CEO the Jahana was having a very clear plan of what needed to be done. Uh, he first had to sign off with his board. So once he signed off with his board, uh, before he goes to National Treasury, he must have another step again, mm-hmm. make sure the public enterprise is happy with that. That's another delay. By the time he gets to National Treasury, mm-hmm. who must finally sign off on this thing, competition has already taken that space. Uh, so it's just an unnecessary layer. So the sooner that like, that it goes, I think it's, it's good riddance for Jamnandas to go. Uh, but he must not go alone. He must. That whole department must be uh, dismantled, and uh, those people must be all reallocated into the various government departments. That will also that will just help efficiency. Then government departments can liaise directly with treasury mm-hmm. without some uh, problematic intermediary in between. So yeah. Yeah. What are some of the critical steps that guides uh, public procurement? Uh, and how will the EFF government ensure compliance in as far as the acquisition of goods and services is concerned? Yeah. Look, I think, uh, firstly, as I said, that uh, in the EFF government, the issue of procurement is not going to be a major item. It's going to be a minor item yeah. because most of the procurement, most of the uh, services should be provided by the state. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then the rest of the other ancillary services and all of that, um, we've made some submissions, for instance, in the public procurement bill as to how those should be, including uh, set-asides, sure. uh, for instance, we want to do that in the interim, have those set-asides that uh, uh, particularly for black businesses, because if you don't do set-asides for them, uh, it then means that uh, you are you are treating, you, you are providing equal treatment to unequal people. South Africans sometimes want to forget that we've got apartheid uh, legacy. Apartheid legacy means black people are here, white people are here uh, in terms of economic muscle. Mm-hmm. So you can't then, as a responsible government, forget this. Uh, so therefore, you've got to look after these people. For instance, what you should have, we should say, uh, for instance, all the bread that will go to the prisons mm-hmm. uh, or to the correctional facilities must all be procured from black bakeries, uh, as an example. That's what you would do. Uh, then you would, uh, it's a set aside for them that it's only them that can do this. Then that means that uh, uh, business people that are in the precarity space have got a, a piece of the action that they're guaranteed. You see, one of the biggest things in black business is the market, and people don't seem to understand this, that uh, it, there's no point in you having a farm, but you've got no market, you can have the best grapes, mm-hmm. but if you don't have off-take agreements, you have a problem. Mm-hmm. So the, the, the approach that the EFF would take is to make sure that all the designated uh, service provisions by people that we want to empower, that the off-take agreements in the main will be by the, by, by, by the government mm-hmm. uh, and, and all of that. So you've got a farm producing cabbages, Government must be one of the chief buyers of those cabbages. You mustn't produce nice cabbages and you don't know what to do with those cabbages. They rot uh, yeah. at the end. So it would be the approach that uh, uh, the EFF would take. Yeah. And the Tower Best uh, uh, saga borders on somewhat uh, public procurement because we understand that G4S uh, was uh, the company that was uh, providing security uh, services. So obviously under the EFF government, the state should be able to render uh, such services to also prevent uh, such cases of, you know, you find prisoners escaping because they've got the financial muscles to do so. Yeah. Look, yeah, I think that, that, that that's, that's a, a very good example uh, mm-hmm. of uh, abdication of responsibility as well, mm-hmm. where you have a private company mm-hmm. that uh, is virtually running the prison for you. Uh, that's exactly the maximum prison. Yeah, ma- yeah. You see, this is this is a problem. Yeah. And then now, when this happens, there's no chief director or or some government official that can really account. The person's gonna say no, but the PPP is run by G4, four four what's the four GS or GS four G four S G four S. Yeah. They ask those people mm-hmm. uh, and all of that. I mean, it's totally an irresponsible uh, model. Uh, so. Uh, so, so indeed, uh, for, for us as the EFF, we're happy to have the bot model build, operate, and transfer mm-hmm. uh, thing, but that operate 
mm-hmm. must not be too long. It's just to get it working, make sure that everything works, and then it must be transferred immediately. Mm-hmm. Then the government must uh, must take over the. It mustn't be the. I mean, this whole notion of permanence of private sector in uh, uh, service delivery things of government is a problem. Sure. You can't have a G4S as a permanent feature uh, in this thing. They would have done what they have done, put the system into place, everything, pay them, let them go. We must build another prison somewhere. Mm-hmm. Then government must take over. And by the way, one of the flaws in this whole model of a uh, bot is that at operation phase, a different legal dispensation, dispensation obtains. Mm-hmm. Now, in there, there'll be all kinds of efficiencies that are done because those companies don't have to follow PFMA. They can do things quickly and all of that. Sure. Uh, then you think, hey, this thing is moving. Mm-hmm. But then transfer and then you put it into the PFMA. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, things don't work as well. Then they say, you see, she left, left it to private sector. <laughs> well, in fact, the truth of the matter is that PFMA yeah. as, a, as, a, as a law to manage government business is a flop. I can tell you sure. this right now. It's a flop. So that PFMA needs to be uh, upgraded uh, so that it can respond to uh, what government needs to do. But right now, it's actually at another level. It's an impediment. Sure. Um, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Now we are gravitating towards the most historic uh, elections, the yeah. 2024 general elections. How would you describe these elections as compared to the elections that were held in 1994? I think these elections are much more fundamental than the elections of 1994. Much more fundamental. Because these elections are really about uh, what Nkrumah said, these elections. Nkrumah is the guy that uh, would have said that uh, the various companies must get their independence and then once they have their independence, amalgamate uh, to form this uh, one Africa, as it were. You cannot do that with the kind of dispensation that the ANC has laid out. You need a complete overhaul, complete mm-hmm. overhaul, which is what the EFF wants to do. So as I said earlier, that uh, what needs to happen is that firstly we must accept that uh, we don't have a political dispensation as we thought. Mm -hmm. So the EFF has got more than economic emancipation to do, but has got a political takeover as well to do. So that's what needs to happen, so that the country can be truly sovereign. Mm -hmm. Uh, Right now, South Africa, it's a... it's, it, it's, it's not true that we're, sovereign. we're not a sovereign state mm. here. We cannot make decisions on our own uh, as South Africa without consulting or being told by the West what we need to do because we are a member of the Commonwealth. You know, one of the key things about being a member of the Commonwealth is that the condition mm-hmm. to be a member of the Commonwealth is that you must accept that the, 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 the crown is the head of the Commonwealth. Sure. So what's... What more do you need to know that we're actually a colony, uh, in dis- a disguised colony, mm-hmm. you know? So so when the EFF takes over, the first thing we kick out the Commonwealth so that once a decision is taken in Winnie Mandela House, that decision is not going to be reviewed anywhere. It's a final decision. It doesn't have to get the right a sign off at Stellenbosch in London, the US. No, it's a South African decision gets taken here in this house. Government must implement uh, so that's what uh, the EFF government would do. So mm-hmm. the 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 past 30 years were 30 years of hope that we actually thought what I'm what, what we're saying today is what was going to happen. Mm-hmm. But we now know that 30 years later, actually, uh, we were sold a lemon and we thought it's an orange. Ish. So the EFF has got a serious responsibility on its hands mm-hmm. to change the entire thing mm-hmm. and make sure that we we revive the, uh, the the fight of our kings mm-hmm. because this 112 years of the ANC uh, has not done anything. In fact, they've undermined all the uh, the wars that our kings have fought. Mm. They just came in, they just sold out, uh, they went into and stayed in London. How can you stay in London and drive <laughs> transformation in South Africa? I mean, yeah. it's just a clearest example that we're sold out here. So indeed... I think uh, the EFF has got a serious responsibility to sure. encourage everyone that uh, wants South Africa to be purely sovereign mm-hmm. to vote for the EFF because the EFF 
is indeed the future. I mean, if you, even if you look at who attends our our rallies in sure. the main, it's the future, it's the young people. Mm -hmm. So I think there is that realization. We must just make sure that more of the young people come out in their numbers. We all, all also have the old people as well. But in the main, the young people, this is their future. Mm -hmm. We don't ask you in the EFF about, did you go to Quadro? We don't ask sure. you in the EFF whether you're in Kabwe. We don't mm -hmm. ask you in the EFF whether you're in Clip Town and all of these <laughs> funny places. We don't ask you any of that. Mm -hmm. We just want your contribution here and now. So an organization that is going to recognize you now as a young person mm -hmm. is only the EFF. Yeah. Fight Amzonere, man, thank you very much for making time here and obviously giving us the most comprehensive and pragmatic sense of uh, public uh, procurement and how the EFF government is going to champion that. We really appreciate your, your time. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you very much. We have come to the end of today's uh, episode of the EFF uh, podcast. Please remember to like and subscribe to the EFF uh, YouTube channel so that we can continue giving you uh, the most uh, ideal uh, podcast and content. And uh, happy Easter to you and yours. Uh, my name is Titus Tsungu. Until we meet again, good ekwenget. Kanumab. Revolutionary greetings to the people of South Africa, Africa, and the diaspora. Let me begin by thanking each and every one of you for the support you have shown to the EFF when we were celebrating our historic 10th anniversary. You were part of history as you gave as little as you could from SMS donations, cows, water, transport, and many others. You funded the celebration of a revolution, and for that, you must be very proud. The revolution, however, is far from over. In 2024, we have an opportunity to fix the mistakes of the past and secure the future of our country for generations to come. We started our journey on these streets of Soweto, where we were formed. We are now on our way to the Winon Building. South Africa needs a government that will create jobs, provide houses, and provide adequate health care and sanitation for our people. It is not fair for our people to live like this. We need a government that will change the lives of our people for the better and put an end to unemployment, landlessness, homelessness, and low shedding that is destroying our economy. We are therefore calling on you to walk this journey with us on the road to victory in 2024. We call on you to support and oil the election machinery by donating towards the liberation of our people. We appeal to you to donate as little as you can. Please donate cows, groceries, vegetables, t-shirts, water, transport for our volunteers, anything within your means to finance the revolution. The dedicated volunteers and ground forces of the EFF from Mafikeng to Mdanzani, from Alexander to Messina, Umlazi to Kailicha will require food, transport and resources to deliver you to the promised land. To contact us, please dial 063-685-1695 or email us at tgo at effonline.org. Your support will deliver the EFF to the Union Building and deliver economic freedom in our lifetime. Be part of history and make sure that we correct the betrayals of the past. We need you to once again to stand up and be counted, South Africa. Let's make 2024 our 1994. Let's finance the revolution today. Stand up, South Africa. Make sure that South Africa, you are counted with me. Run, South Africa. Stand and make sure that our people understand that the need to be revolution in South Africa is guaranteed that under the EFF, this country will be the better. EFF is a covert thing.